uh, Rodrigo, with Rodrigo Moreno. So the research is still very much uh, a work in progress and I'm sure will continue uh, to be, but uh, I'll give you some of the results uh, that I've had so far. Can I just check, are your screens being blocked by a white uh, box there or have you got the full screen up? Yeah. We have the full screen. You've got the, okay, thank you. In the last decades, I'm sorry, I've got some problem here. I'm sorry. Is it a problem advancing the slide? No, yes, there is, because someone's, I got a message that it's being recorded and I can't get the message off the screen. If you just click uh, yes. outside of that message. Yeah. yeah. That's right. There we go. Uh. <clears throat> Like you've got the next slide, all right? Have you? I, my we do. Is still being blocked. I'm very sorry about that. So, in the last decades of the 17th century, a privileged few in Spain and the Americas were greeted with a novelty: volumes of elaborately decorated manuscript charts of the Pacific coastline of the Americas, from California all the way down to Tierra del Fuego, and they were filled with navigational directions and toponyms in fine script. Whether by chance or design, their first appearance, apparent appearance in 1669, came just a year after the breakup of the Iberian Union between Spain and Portugal under the Treaty of Lisbon. And boasting a curated selection of the knowledge accumulated by Spanish and earlier Portuguese pilots and cartographers over the previous 150 years, these derroteros testified to the endurance of pilots the long reach of the conquistadors and to the skill of cartographers. They also show details of the terrestrial spaces filled by the Spanish occupation of the coastal plain between the ocean and the mountains, as can be seen in this chart of a bay off the coast of Central America. In their comprehensiveness, their religious dedica dedications and unique uh, artistry these derroteros stood apart from the more workmanlike charts, pilot charts, and records of exploratory voyages from which they were drawn, such as the derrotero, shown on the screen now in this slide, re which recorded the discoveries by Sebastian Vizcaino to the north of Acapulco in his voyage of 1602 and three, and whose coastal profiles included vital navigational information such as such as depths, anchorages, compass bearings, and distance scales, which are largely missing from the ornate versions. So in this slide, I'm just showing you the various sections that I will use for this talk. A brief description of the six derroteros that I've identified, their main characteristics, examples of common features, uh, their provenance and authorization and authorship, and the missing Rosario uh, de Rotero, uh, which deserves a mention. Then a section on sources, the authorization for them, and my conclusion. So the six uh, de Roteros are the following. There's uh, the first one that is, is held at the Society of Antiquaries, which is a single volume of coastal charts dated Panama, 1669. Then a single volume of coastal charts uh, dated also Panama, 1669 at the Huntington Library. Uh, then two companion volumes, one containing details of all Spain's sailing routes in the Pacific with a handful of charts and the other volume uh, just the coastal charts. Both of those are dated Panama 1684 and are held by the Hispanic Society in New York. And then a single volume of coastal charts annotated with additional information, no apparent title page uh, held at the Biblioteca Nacional de España. And a partial set of 17 coastal charts uh, for, out of a total of 151 
uh, one can see from the page numbering, which, is, uh, which are the ones from my own collection. No title page, or at least it's absent, and the date apparently is 1697. I refer to that uh, collection as the SPSA uh, in further references during the talk. A notable absentee from this lineup is the Derotero seized by Bartolomeu Sharp from the Santa Rosario Galleon in 1681 and missing since it was copied by William Hack to form the principal model for the many Hack atlases which followed. I will refer to two other Deroteros which are related to these ornate ones, but which do not belong in the same uh, category. Uh, first to that is the Derotero in the Museo Naval de Madrid, known as MS1202, and published in facsimile, which we see in this slide, with an extensively researched introduction by Rodrigo Moreno and Jorge Ortiz in 2018. Uh, the Derotero consists of a very large compilation begun by an anonymous author in Lima in 1675 of pilot charts with the stated intention of publishing them uh, to assist pilots. And the other one is a Derotero in the British Library known as Sloan uh, 239, recorded as a Spanish book of original drawings of the South Sea taken by Bartolomeu Sharp out of a captured Spanish vessel. But it is sadly not the missing Sharp Rosario example. It lacks the elaborate detail and colors of the ornate Deroteros. Much of it is still in rough and unfinished form, but it uses the same sequence of charts, although rather fewer than the ornate Deroteros. And that suggests it derives from the same model. It contains several English an annotations which refer to Captain John Eaton, who was active in the Pacific in 1684. I've circled uh, the image on the left hand of the slide, uh, to, which is a reference to Captain Eaton careened his ship. And there are other similar markings on several of the other charts. Turning now to the main characteristics that the Deroteras share, the general ones that they have in common are their title pages, at least of the, the four Deroteros for which we have title pages, they're all very similar and describe the contents as un derotero general del mar del sur. And all these four are actually datelined Panama. The pages have prominent religious features, which you see in the detail here. Uh, they incorporate within a circle under a crown the monogram of the Virgin Mary, the intertwined letters A and M signifying auspicio Maria, meaning for under the protection of Mary, and the words concebida sin mancha de pecado original are written around the circle of three of them, and the fourth has Ave Maria Stelle Ave or Hail, Star of the Sea. They share an identical sequence and similar number of charts, variously between 149 up to 152, uh, all starting from California and reaching down to Tierra del Fuego, with one final chart, an additional as out of sequence chart of the Pacific Islands discovered by Quiros. And I've showed them on the slide here from the uh, copy held by the Antiquaries uh, Library and the Huntington Library. Uh, and you can see the similarities between them. Uh, also note the Huntington and the Antiquaries one on the left hand side of the slide of California are the only charts uh, of any of the Deroteros with a latitude scale on them. The charts and the positioning of the navigational and topographical notes are all very similar in their design, their layout and content. And in some cases, virtually identical as shown in these examples of exactly the same chart from four of the Deroteros. Each one 
also includes a Dorota page of directions to the river estuary of Guayaquil, which was, of course, a very important base uh, for the Spaniards and was a frequent target for buccaneers. The charts do not have compass roses or depths, but some include anchorages. And the only two with latitude scales that I've mentioned are the first California charts in the Huntington and the Antiquaries volumes. And a few distance scales also appear randomly on three or four charts. The coloring and draftsmanship vary in sophistication, but all are painstakingly and very well done by contrast with the rough work of Sloan 239, this small uh, pilot book uh, in the British Library. Four of the Deroteras use identical small folio page sizes, and two of them use large folio paper sizes. The SPSA, that's my collection, and the Huntington one, 918, both have Strasbourg lily watermarks, which are the two to the left of the slide, while the uh, MS211, 221, that's the Antiquaries de Rotero, and the uh, Biblioteca Nacional de España uh, de Rotero, and indeed the small pilot version, the two, Sloan 239, the three on the right hand side of this slide. Uh, all have very similar watermarks, which are three circles under a crown and a cross, but with what appear to be different batch numbers uh, written into the circles. Uh, turning now to examples of common features between the Deroteras, the, the charts all show a high degree of uniformity, not only in their coastal drawings and mountain silhouettes, but in some of the more unusual landmarks that they choose to include. And here are two of the more striking ones on the coast of Central America. This first one shows two tall trees on what is the coast of uh, Guatemala, uh, known as Las Anabacas, and very, very distinctive uh, drawings of these trees, also referred to in the text. That's three of them I put up on this slide along the top. The one at the foot of the, of the slide is actually from the collection of the Lima pilot charts, which demonstrates uh, how closely the ornate Deroteras were based on the pilot chart originals. And another uh, interesting uh, and distinctive one they have in common is the across of the encomienda uh, on this hillside uh, which is at uh, a section of the coastline of Mexico and Guatemala. It's an area where uh, at the time there was a Dominican uh, settlement in the area and I don't know if they were responsible for erecting the cross but apparently it was a large timber cross which could be seen from out at sea and was used as a landmark uh, by navigators. The interest from the point of view of these ornate Deroteras is the form given to the cross. And you will see that uh, there are two of them which uh, depict the cross as a Maltese cross. Uh, the other ones, the original compilation of the pilot charts, which is the one bottom right, has it as a standard Greek cross, but there are two very distinctive ones in red to the top left of this slide. I can't tell you their significance, but I'm pretty sure that uh, they all refer to, uh, probably as a, 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 a cross linked to whoever was the recipient for the Derotero. And I'll say a little bit more about the Maltese cross uh, in a moment. A third interesting chart they all have in common is a, a ship uh, finding its position by means of triangulation. And all of the Deroteras have this slide, uh, including the, the Lima uh, pilot chart compilation and the Sloan uh, 239, the small uh, pilot chart uh, version, and the ornate Deroteras, and they all have the same one.
Now, this next slide here shows another aspect of the uniformity uniting these derroteros, which is the detail they share of towns and settlements along the inhabited sections of the coastline. And uh, it's a fairly remarkable amount of detail, uh, just taking the small images I put up here from the top left, moving to the right, we have a coal mine, a pyramid, uh, then we have a, a road and a bridge. The image on the top right of the slide is a ferry. Uh, bottom left, we have uh, fishing, fishermen's houses. Then we have a named uh, shipyard uh, belonging to uh, 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 Francisco Morales. Another, the next slide are uh, small mills or workshops and then we have a named ranch uh, belonging to uh, Don Pedro de Guinea, and those appear on all of the Deroteros. I'm going to turn now to their provenance and their uh, authorship, uh, in so far as we can find out, and starting off with the companion volumes in the Hispanic Society collection, uh, known as K44A and B in the society. And they are the most sumptuous and lavish of the Deroteros with their matching title pages and the same uh, date line of Panama, 30th of December, 1684. And they share the unique distinction of having an identified author, albeit he's not named within the volumes. They each carry a different library stamp indicating that they were held in separate library collections of Spanish noblemen at some point. And a pasted note in K44A shows that it and possibly the other one was listed in a 1909 catalog of Carl Heinemann, who was an antiquarian book dealer in Leipzig from whom Archer Huntington acquired many of the books for the Hispanic Society, which he founded in 1904. A separate document held in Spanish archives and to whose reference I'm indebted to Chet relates directly to their composition and to their intended recipient. It is a letter also dated 30th of December 1684 by a man called Fernando Mojedano de Saavedra y Córdoba, a distinguished military engineer who played a leading part in the reconstruction of Panama City after its sacking by Morgan in 1681. In the letter, uh, I beg your pardon, in 1671, in, in the letter, Saavedra dedicates his two derroteros to the Conde de Oropesa, who since 1680 was president of the Consejo de Castilla, effectively head of the Spanish government and the second most powerful man after the king. Saavedra presents the two volumes as, offering, as an offering of appreciation, a rendering to Caesar, he says, of what is due to Caesar. He says they are his own work based on the sources of the finest navigators uh, and divided into two volumes, one containing charts and the other sailing routes with a handful of charts. Interesting, one of the sailing routes he uh, includes is a full transcript of the onboard log of the Le Maire Schouten voyage of 1615 to 17. And another of the sailing routes is replicated uh, exactly in the copy uh, translated by Dacini for Hack in the copy made by Hack from the captured Rosario de Rotero. The identification of Saavedra as the author of these two volumes and the Conde de Oropesa as its recipient explains both their fine quality and the excellence of their draftsmanship by a man trained in designing buildings and military fortifications, as we can also see in his map of the new Panama City on the left of the slide here and his design for fortifications of Portobello. Now, interestingly, Saavedra's charts contain two apparent trademark signatures. One of them is a dot surrounded by a tiny circle, which he places apparently randomly on some churches. And the other is a distinctive 
depiction of roofs with fine red lines, very different from the block coloring uh, used in the other Deroteros. And another noteworthy feature of his charts is the exceptional detail of the ships, most probably due to the skilled work of the miniaturist and their proliferation on his chart of Lima, as you can see in this close up here, must have represented a huge expense to him. The authors of the other Deroteros may also have used a miniaturist, but miniaturist for their uh, ships, but nothing quite so fine as these. Now, these trademark signatures of Saavedra offer a clue to the likely author of uh, 2957, the Biblioteca Nacional de España, Derotero, which bears an uncanny resemblance to the Saavedra volumes. Its provenance uh, is unclear from the BNE catalog, at least so far as I've been able to judge online, and it carries no library stamps or title page. The charts are preceded by an informal preface which continues as further annotations superimposed on each of the charts. While the hand of these annotations and that of the notes on the charts is different from that of Saavedra's 44A and B, the similarity of the charts themselves to those of Saavedra's with their design and draftsmanship is indisputable and the colouring is similar but less lavish than 44A and B. As I think you can see on this slide, where we have uh, the Saavedra uh, charts on the bottom two images and the uh, BNE charts uh, above them sitting on the top line. But you can see they are very close indeed to each other. The possibility that Saavedra is the author is strengthened by the appearance on many of the BNE charts are the same two distinctive Saavedra trademark signatures, which we saw in his K44B Derotero. The circled dot randomly placed on churches and the same design for roofs. So again, on this slide, the Saavedra charts are on the left and I put the BNE ones on the right. And you can see that same uh, dot with the circle and the center uh, images are the roofs with the Saavedra one, the, the more brightly colored one at the top and the BNE one underneath it. Uh, 2957, that is the BNE one, also shows an intriguing change to the depiction of San Diego Fort on the Acapulco chart. Whereas in Saavedra's K44B, on the left of the, uh, the slide here, it is incorrectly shown as a fort with four bastions, in 2957, it has been corrected to its five bastions with entrance arch, exactly as it stands to this day. And it is drawn with what appears to be Saavedra's style of draftsmanship. So possibly the result of Saavedra rectifying an incorrect detail at his second attempt. Perhaps he'd actually had a chance to visit the fort himself in the meantime. So turning now to the Huntington Derotero, it has a colorful history. Its more recent provenance is known. Henry Huntington, the American railroad tycoon and stepfather to Archer, who founded the Hispanic Society, bought the Derotero for his library at auction in 1923. The circumstan circumstantial evidence suggests that this is the volume seized by Henry Morgan during the destruction of Panama City in 1671 and sent to London by the governor of Jamaica on Morgan's behalf. The governor requested a copy be made of it. And this was done apparently by Joseph Moxon, a mathematician and royal cartographer. There are references to the original circulating for some years in courtly circles and amongst members of the Royal Society before trace was lost. The Moxon copy, which includes charts and Spanish texts with annotated, annotated English translations on each chart, in the same familiar sequence and style as the Huntington 918, appears to be that which came into the possession of Lord Harley, Earl of Oxford. It is now in the British Library as Harley MS 4034. A curious anomaly in the Moxon volume is the inversion of the first chart of the California Peninsula, which he has facing north, as you see in this slide, rather than the southward orientation used in the 
uh, Huntington 918, and in all the other Deroteras. And you'll see that Moxon, whose chart is on the left of this slide, has omitted the latitude scale shown in 918, the one on the right hand side. And just going back again to that image uh, of the uh, Bay of Nicoya, uh, we have the, the Huntington Deroteras on the left and Moxon's copy on the right. And you can see how very uh, closely uh, Moxon followed uh, the original. The only real difference being the addition of the uh, English translation, which he uh, squeezed in uh, wherever he could uh, around the charts. Another oddity in the uh, Moxon uh, copy is in the last uh, chart, the Kiros chart of the islands, which has the English colophon uh, surveyed by order of the King of Spain and finished at Panar. Anno Domini 1669, which I've highlighted in the bottom right there on this slide. It's a phrase which does not appear on the original uh, 918, the Huntington uh, Derotero, as we see it today, nor indeed on any of the other Deroteros. So this may have been no more than an editorial flourish by Moxon, the copyist, to add authority to his copy, or perhaps there was an inset to this effect in the 918 Derotero, which has not survived. If there was, it would seem more likely that any survey uh, would have been related to a terrestrial land uh, census, I think, than to pilot charts, which after all already existed uh, for a long time and represented the knowledge of pilots accumulated over a lengthy period, rather than by any specific uh, survey carried out uh, for the purpose by on the king's instructions, but still a question mark over that. And while the title page of uh, 918, the Huntington one, provides no clues as to its author, a strong claim can be made for its owner, having been Juan Perez de, Guzma, de Guzman, who was governor of Panama. Elizabeth Chant, who gave a talk on the antiquaries de Rotary in 2019, found that Guzman was a member of the Order of the Knights of Malta, whose cross is depicted on the Encomienda Hill of the Huntington 918 Derritero, as it is on the Antiquaries version. Another clue which may link Guzman to the 918, to the Huntington one, is in his reputed bibliophilia. He had only been reinstated as governor by the Viceroy in 1668, after a period of imprisonment and disgrace resulting from charges which were proved to be false. Professor Arthur Castillero's account in La Ciudad Imaginada of the sacking of Panama by Morgan in 1671 records that Guzman's greatest pride and joy was his book collection. His governor's residence survived the burning of the city, uh, but to Guzman's greatest distress, Morgan's men, finding it had survived, stole from it his valuable furniture, books, and art collection. And the very the Derotero may very well have been amongst its treasures, either commissioned by Guzman himself, or perhaps as a gift to mark his return to the governorship. The Society of Antiquaries, Derotero, which we see on the slide here. Uh, is another mystery. The society's records suggest that their Derotero came to the society between 1816 and 1831, but they have no other details of its provenance. Uh, the binding is actually 19th century and clearly done uh, after it arrived at the society. And in fact, uh, that bottom right hand corner of the title page on the left of the slide here is done in fact simile. Uh, so the binding was possibly in rather poor condition uh, and the title page was repaired. In his monograph on the Derotero, Peter Barber has considered the possibility that it, rather than the Huntington Derotero, could possibly, be, possibly have been the one seized by Morgan, or that it may have been acquired by a society member at a time when many Spanish libraries were looted during the Peninsular War. Its smaller format, however, 
suggests to me that it's less likely to have been the model for the Harley 4034, the, the Moxon copy, which more closely resembles the larger folio size of the Huntington one, the 918, which I think might have made the copying a little bit easier. In any event, the well, the draftsmanship, uh, the colouring and script of uh, the antiquaries Derotero, the 221, are very different in style from the Saavedra ones, the 44s and the Huntington 918. The quality of the drawings, the sophisticated use of colour and the fine calligraphy all point to a work of the highest standard and value. Not easily apparent from the photos here, I'm afraid, but the walls of every building depicted on the charts are picked out in silver and some of them even in gold. And the colorist has also made generous use of lapis lazuli blue uh, combined with silver on many of the charts, which was a distinctive and extravagant combination not seen on the other Deroteros. And this clearly was a Derotero composed for someone of exceptional importance. Uh, perhaps a viceroy, or indeed the president of the council back in Spain. I've shown on this slide uh, the detail of one of the charts, uh, together with Vermeer's portrait of a girl with a pearl earring, uh, which was painted by Vermeer only four years before the date of the 1669 Derotero, and Vermeer used lavish amounts of lapis lazuli to paint the ribbon in the girl's hair. And then the 17 charts in my own collection form a volume, as I said, uh, with the binding title of Spanish Plans of South America, which appear, it appears to have been rebound by a bookseller in Hamilton, Scotland, apparently early in the 19th century. With the date of 1697 on one of the chart cartouches, it is possible what may have been a, an original complete Derotero, to judge from the page numbering, which goes up to 151, it is, uh, it is possible it fell into buccaneer hands in the early 18th century before it was broken up. It may even have come from the hall seized by Woods Rogers in 1709 from a galleon whose inventory included some 52 atlases but how it found its way from an early 19th century bookbinder in Scotland and then to an antique shop in Santiago is yet another mystery. Despite the nearly 30 years difference between this one and the Huntington Derotero, the charts, the script and navigational directions bear a very close resemblance to each other and are almost indistinguishable, as I think you can probably judge from the comparison of the two charts in this slide. And as I already mentioned, uh, both of them use the same Strasbourg Lily watermark and the same folio sized paper. The quality of both SPSA, as I call it, and the Huntington 918 is less extravagant than the no expense spared Hispanic Society and Antiquaries Society uh, versions. However, the SPSA Derrota is one of three boasting a cartouche, which appears on the chart of the Bay of Valiano. The other two, which I show in the slide here, being the antiquaries and the Huntington volumes. Again, the finer design of the antiquaries version in the top right of the slide contrasts with the rather cruder versions of the other two. And in detail here, only the SPA cartouche includes a date, the 1697 date but both it and the Huntington cartouches include the letters MC, which may possibly refer to the name of the cartographer. So possibly it could be the same hand uh, despite the difference in dates. I think less likely that MC refers to the recipient. We wouldn't have had, I think, two Derroteros uh, being made for the same person. So I think almost certainly MC would be the, the cartographer here. The antiquaries cartouche on the right, as you can see, is more finely drawn and includes a Maltese cross, uh, which again rep may represent a discreet acknowledgement to the recipient as a knight of the Order of Malta, as already suggested by Elizabeth Chant 
in her 2019 talk, as I mentioned. And as I've also uh, mentioned in the talk, that Maltese cross appears on the chart of the Encomienda Hill, uh, possibly for the same reason. And missing, but not, I think, forgotten, and we shouldn't forget it, the Rosario de Rotero, uh, because it is uh, relevant uh, to uh, these other ones. The two best clues uh, to its contents and composition are provided by. I think the first hack uh, copy made from it uh, in October 1682 uh, by hack, but in the name, this first one, in the name of Bartholomew Sharp for King Charles II, uh, with the accompanying translation of the sailing routes by Dassigny, and also by the Wagoner, based on again the Rosario de Rotero by Basil Ringrose who had access to that Derotero during the long voyage home from the Pacific. But he, of course, was officially prevented from publishing his own version. A comparison of these Hack and Ringrose charts with those of the uh, Hispanic Society ones, the Saavedra ones, uh, which I've shown on this slide here, We've got the Saavedra one in the center bottom and the antiquaries one center top with Hack on the left and uh, Ring Rose on the right. And the comparison uh, shows that the Rosario Derotero clearly belonged to the category of these ornate Deroteros. The sailing routes translated by Dassigny uh, which do not appear in the later hack versions, must have formed part of the Rosario de Rotero, which will thus have more, perhaps more closely resembled the two volume Saavedra copies of K44A and B in the Hispanic Society, uh, which have the, the, the separate collection of sailing routes, which don't appear in any of the other de Roteros, at least as we have them, but uh, are included uh, in the, uh, were included, must have been included in the Rosario one, as translated by Dassigny. It's perhaps worth noting that whereas Hack omitted, perhaps for editorial reasons, the six charts to the north of Acapulco, Ringrose included all of them, albeit with a depiction of California as an island rather than a peninsula, uh, then a, a theory somewhat in vogue, while all the Spanish versions, of course, showed California correctly as a peninsula. Uh, Ringrose must have decided he knew best, uh, but got that wrong. Turning now to sources, uh, all these ornate derroteros, as I indicated earlier, have much in common with the collection of pilot charts assembled by an unknown hand and referenced as uh, MS-12 02, now in the Museo Naval de Madrid, and published in fact, fact similarly, as I said, by uh, Rodrigo Moreno and Jorge Ortiz. But uh, the, the latter, the 1202, lack the terrestrial detail of the ornate versions. And when they show, when they show off, onshore settlements, it is mainly as a profile visible from the sea, as you can see on this slide uh, here with the 1202 one on the left and the uh, antiquaries uh, equivalent on the right of the slide. The sequence of charts in 1202 mirrors that of the ornate Dero Terrace, but with many additional coastal close-ups. And the sequence only starts from Acapulco. As Moreno and Ortiz have established, a principal source for 1202 is the pilot Melchor Polo, who died in 1648. Thus, it appears that the ornate Deroteros in their maritime aspects represent an edited version, either of the pilot charts assembled by the compiler of 1202 or of a similar collection of the same charts, but with a significant addition of many more terrestrial details. And whoever authorized their production in 1669 decided the collections should include the section of six charts from California, omitted by the compiler of 1202. The exceptional detail of land settlements, which are shown particularly on some of the Central America charts, 
would appear to be drawn there from other sources, some of it perhaps from local knowledge, but more likely from official land surveys, which were a regular feature of Spanish administration of their colonial conquests. And as for authorization, the fact that the ornate deuterius use the same selection of charts and notes with only a few minor variants indicates they must all have been following an agreed model, which will itself have had to be selected, designed and approved, similar to the way the Casa de la Constatación had maintained the master copy of the Padron Real in the early 16th century. As Moreno Nortiz had pointed out, the anonymous compiler of 1202 was unable to obtain authorization to publish his material because of its continuing sensitivity. However, in the case of the ornate deuterius, the incorporation of so much sensitive material in a single volume would have been more easily justified since they were not being printed and were destined for the eyes of the privileged few. At the very least, the authority of the cosmographer Mayor at the Viceroyalty in Peru would have been required for their compilation. By now, the shift from Spain to the colonial authorities in Lima of responsibility for all aspects of navigation in the Mar del Sur was well advanced with relevant institutions such as nautical and mathematical schools established in Lima and Mexico. The cosmographer Mayor, the Peruvian Viceroyalty, a post dating from 1618, at the time of the first Deroteros were produced in 1669, was Francisco Ruz, Ruiz Lozano. It can be no coincidence that, as recorded by Jorge Ortiz in his paper on the Cosmographus Mayoris, when Lozano applied for the job in 1661, he offered in support of his credentials his own draft of Un Derrotero General del Mar del Sur, based on information which he had collected on his voyages. And although that Derrotero appears not to survive, Lozano's own experience of compiling one, a comprehensive one, has obvious relevance to the appearance of the ornate Deroteros under his jurisdiction. So in conclusion, these ornate Deroteros are linked and represent a distinctive body of work from a unique period of maritime cartography in the closing decades of the 17th century. The detail in some of them is as much terrestrial as maritime, and for good reason. The motive behind their production seems to have been for presentation to powerful patrons in the Spanish and colonial administrations, just as Hack made his copies for the king and senior dignitaries in England. By including extensive details of the towns and settlements along the coastal plain, an element largely missing from the pilot chart originals, their authors and the bureaucracy behind them set out to make the Deroteros a record not only of Spanish knowledge of the Pacific coastline, but also of the colonial occupation of the lands which Spain had conquered, and therefore more worthy of the attention of the noble recipients. And it's surely ironic that the production of these magnificent derroteros and the capture by buccaneers of at least two of them, along with other pilot charts, helped to reveal the secrets of the Great South Sea to Spain's enemies and contributed to the erosion of the, almost, of the almost exclusive control which Spain had exercised over the Pacific since Magellan's voyage of 1520. Thank you. I conclude there. And we'll look forward to any discussion we may have now. Hello. I, I thought it was excellent, Anthony. Thank you very, very much indeed. Uh, fascinating, to be honest. I'd be interested yeah. to know whether there are more derroteros somewhere else in the world. Well, I'm sure there, there will be others, and I don't pretend that this is a, that I've, I've tracked them all down. But I think probably not very many more because they their production would have involved a lot of expense and time and were probably just being made for a relatively small number of very important people. So mm. while I'm sure there are others uh, which may have survived and may still be lurking in libraries or collections, I don't think there'll be very many of them. But there are a great many unanswered questions. And a major one is why were the, these ones all apparently uh, produced in Panama rather than Lima? 
one might have expected them to be made in Lima, uh, as indeed the, the compilation of the pilot charts, the 1202 uh, collection uh, in the Museo Naval de Madrid uh, was, uh, made, was put together in Lima. So uh, lots, of, lots of unanswered questions and much more research, I think, needs <laughs> to be done to, uh, to try and ferret out more of the answers. Chat, no se escucha. Rodrigo, hello. Thank you. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, Anthony, I, I had to, well, first I wanted to compliment you on a very clear, uh, clearly structured and clearly delivered talk. Um, and I wanted to ask you about the handwriting, whether you had a chance to compare, in addition to some of the iconographic details, the handwriting in any of the manuscripts. I've not done a lot of uh, comparisons, but from the, the two handwritings which look closest uh, seem to be uh, the one in uh, on the charts of, of, of my uh, partial collection and the Huntington. Uh, there are some minor differences in writing, but it is very, very similar. Uh, I'm not, a, of course, an expert, but could be accounted by a different, uh, the same hand, but 30 years apart, uh, if it was the same person still at work on these things. The other handwritings, mm. no, the, the handwritings are very distinctive. The antiquaries one uh, is, is, a, is a very different type of, of script uh, from the Saavedra ones. But I, I rather think that the writing may have been done probably by employed scribes, seems to have been more the custom at that time for it. There were, there were handwriting, handwriters who were employed to produce letters and scripts and so on. And I suspect that um, the handwriting and the annotations were done uh, on command, but by a, a hard hand. Uh, I doubt that the, mm -hmm. I, I doubt that we would detect an author by the handwriting, but I would defer to any handwriting expert and it obviously does require a great deal more research. And I've not tried to sit down and and make detailed comparisons uh, of the handwriting. Yeah, could could I come in here? This is Peter Barber here. Hello, Peter. Uh, first of all, I, I think you're entirely right that this is these are all the productions of a scriptorium where you would get standardization as the number one rule. So I think it's very, very it would be very, very difficult to identify individual hands. And even if you did, you would probably be down to the scribes rather than to the intellectual curate, uh, curators of it. But, you know, first of all, congratulations on your paper, which, you know, I echo everything that Chet said. It's very clear and very persuasive. One thing that strikes me as particularly interesting, though, is that it looks rather as though all of these copies circulated within the colonial elite of South America. There are none of them, with, with the copies of the Padron Real, there's fairly convincing evidence that even those theoretically the contents were secret they were actually presented to the rulers of many rulers of europe for political reasons yes it looks very much as though this lot seems to have circulated only in south america and one wonders how many of them actually reached spain at the time well that's a very interesting thought I, the the Saavedra volumes though might stand apart from that because Saavedra dedicated them to the Presidente of the Consejo de Castilla, so uh, that would that would mm. on the face of it have been destined to be sent back to Spain. Mm. Um, so uh, that one perhaps is, is is different from the others in that respect. But I just wonder how much it says for a degree of autonomy existing even then in Spanish America. Well, I think the, the general historical evidence, certainly from sort of reading around the subject, is that 
in colonial South America, they were very much doing their own thing, mm. separate from Spain by then. And the, of course, the authority of the Casa de la Contratación had been steadily weakening uh, from the end of the 16th century with a sort of ongoing dispute between Seville and Cadiz over who should really run the Casa. Uh, and Spain's position gradually weakening uh, into the 17th century. And the, engaged in wars, the uh, breakup with Portugal. Uh, the, the quite interesting that there's a, there was a, a book produced by a man called Sexasi Tovera, uh, in which he'd used an earlier atlas by a Portuguese cartographer, Tejera, I think it was called, in, which was produced in 1630. And in the 1690s, I think 1692, Texas, and, and, uh, Texas uh, produced a, a book and an appeal to the King of Spain to take a grip on and take control over the route to South America and to exploit the route to uh, the trading coastline of South America in a way, he said, which the other Europeans were already doing, but it was Spain's waters and they were not doing enough to make the most of it. And so clearly uh, he was someone who recognized that Spain's authority had, had really uh, collapsed uh, and that uh, there was a lot going on um, in colonial South America that was beyond, which had fallen out of the immediate control of the authorities uh, in Spain. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Other questions or comments? Very good. Hi, Radha. Hi, Juan. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Juan. Uh, yes, Ted, uh, I would like to ask you, and thanks uh, a lot because that was amazing paper, but I'm very interested in the copies of manuscript map. And um, I'm trying to insert this geographical culture in the manuscript culture in the same moment. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'd like to ask you if you think that these copists are cartographers, you could say that they are map makers, or they were copies of manuscript objects or manuscript texts, because they have, of course, skills in painting, but we can say that they have skills in in map making properly? I think that uh, the period we're talking about in in Lima, and there is this strange thing that, that all these Deroteras seem to have been made in, in Panama, but uh, Lima itself was the, the center that was controlling uh, activity of this kind uh, under their authority. And by now, though, as I mentioned in the talk, uh, the colonial authorities had established very sophisticated uh, educational establishments, mathematical schools, and indeed the cartographer Mayores of, of uh, Peru uh, for years were uh, working to establish their own uh, capabilities in mathematics, engineering, and cartography and navigation. And probably they had as as much and as many competent individuals in all these uh, areas as were available back in Spain. And in, the, in their schools, they would be training people as the Jesuits did in how to draw maps and so on. So there were probably any number of people with the capability to copy maps. I, what, I think, although I've treated them all as, as a, as a, a group of, of uh, similar uh, and in some ways identical uh, volumes, the Saavedra ones, the very ornate ones, do stand out as, as apart from these because Saved, we have actually have a document of Saavedra's saying that I made these myself. And you can clearly see his draftsmanship uh, and engineering skills in the way that the buildings 
are drawn on his on his maps. So whether he had someone else do the basic map and then he then came along and and drew in the the buildings and the forts and so on, or whether he did the whole lot himself, I don't know. And again, this touches on the point that Peter Barber mentioned in, in reference to the script. Uh, there were people there uh, who the script people could churn this stuff out. So if you needed something written, you would tell them, you would, I know, dictate it to them or, or give them the basic text and they would copy it out. It may be that these charts were following a rather similar principle where there were copyists who would copy the basic charts, but some personal touches would be given by people such as Saavedra who had the skills to do this stuff himself. I hope that helps, but again, there are so many questions here which need more research. Julieta, I see you have a question. Yeah, I, well, I just to comment. Um, uh, Anthony, that was just hi. really. Hi, hi, my name is Juliet, and I'm yes, Juliet. Nice, nice was to see you. Kindly invited by Chet to join you. Thank you for a beautiful, beautifully articulated and illustrated talk. I just, I think this study that you've undertaken is really important, and congratulations on acquiring this Terotero. Uh, the Saavedra letter, I think is a really important, seems to be a very important benchmark, but I also thought it was really brilliant of you to identify these stylistic signatures, right? That the circle, yes. with, you know, with, and, and then the rooftops, I think just identifying these stylistic features and, and seeing where they occur in other maps and if they're copied over incorrectly or strangely in other maps would be a really important thing to look for. So thank you so much again for sharing your research yeah. with but it, thanks for raising that. The interesting point is that the in the uh, what I would call the the Saavedra uh, second version the the uh, Derotero held in the Biblioteca Nacional de España, which is so very close to Saavedra and with these telltale trademark signs, is quite curious that the 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 trademark circle with the dot doesn't necessarily appear on the same churches on the same charts. They appear on different charts on different churches and i wondered at first when i spotted them in in the in the saavedra k44b charts if they were perhaps churches that he happened to have visited and had thought i'll stick a little note a little indicator on that there's a place i've been to um but then you look at the the bne derotero which i think was was almost certainly by him too and they don't appear on the same churches, they appear on different ones. Uh, so there doesn't seem to be a, a system. Uh, it does seem, they, they just seem to be a spontaneous little mark that he's put on to indicate either, as I said, it occurred to me he might have visited them, or just to show this is my work. As indeed he says in his letter to the Conde de Oropesa, you know, that I, this is my work. And I think if it was indeed, he was actually drawing all this stuff himself. An artist quite often does like to put on his own little tick to show that it's his, almost as a note to himself. But it's, it's a fascinating thing. And uh, there may be other things I miss. I mean, I might mention another curious thing and related, relating to the missing Rosario de Rotero. The hack uh, copies uh, have, as they all do, the island of Chiloé, on, down or off the coast of Chile. And the hack copy of the Rosario de Rotero shows the town of Castro on the island on the left hand, very distinctive left hand branch of the island, uh, the way it's drawn in these de Rotero. So there's this left branch and the right branch. And the town of Castro on the hack copy is on the left. On all the de Roteros, except for the Saavedra, one in the Hispanic and the BNE one, the town of Castro appears incorrectly, as it happens, on the right hand branch. A Saavedra got it right, um, and the, his copy got it right, and you see both um, Hack uh, getting it right, and uh, Basil Ringrose a little ambiguous. He's done a bit of a, he doesn't depict the town as such, but there's a bit of a scribble uh, on the left hand side of, of the island 
uh, and nothing on the right. So I think quite clearly, if and when the Rosario de Rotero is ever found, it'll be quite clear that it will, it will, it should have the town of Castro on the left-hand side of the island of Chiloé, because uh, th there are these little indicators dotted around these charts, and I'm sure there will be others which I've missed, but um, they, they can be quite revealing when one's comparing one with another. Carolina? Yes, uh, thank you, Terry, for your presentation. I have a question concerning the um, out of sequence chart of the Pacific Islands that you mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, the last chart of the, the yes. Rotero. Um, do you think that its inclusion has to do with the fact that, or with the preponderance of Lima in the, um, in the making of these derroteros? Because the Fernandez de Quiroz expedition had been financed by some of the notables of Lima and, uh, or I don't know, what, what, why do you think, uh, or what do you think well, about the inclusion of this out of sequence chart? Yes, it's quite curious. I, I hadn't given it a lot of thought other than noting that it was a curiosity. Of course, Quiroz uh, was a very important navigator and his, his voyage was of, of great historical significance uh, to Spanish exploration of the Pacific. Uh, and yes, connect obviously linked to Lima. I just think that he was such a sort of foundation figure in cartography of the Pacific that uh, the uh, cosmographers Bayores uh, thought it would be right to recognize Quiros by including a reference to him uh, in these collections. And what better way to do it than to have a chart of his islands and stick it at the, at the right of the back, indeed with, a, with uh, some explanatory notes, which are included on the chart, highlighting the significance of his voyage. Uh, so I think it is, a, it is a sort of testimony to Kiros's importance uh, in the exploration of the Pacific. And yes, I'm sure you're right, you know, tied in to, to Lima as part of that. Thank you, perfect. Other questions, comments? Okay. Thank you. Yes, just to thank Anthony. Great. Oh, Roberto. Very good. Good evening, very Roberto. Hello. Yeah. Good to see you. Well, very good then. We'll we'll wrap things up there. Uh, Anthony, again, thank you very much for taking the time to prepare the talk and deliver it to us. We enjoyed it very much. And you've helped us keep momentum with our work on the hack atlases and the related derroteros. And I hope to be able to announce a new talk in the series soon. Good, so well, thank you. In the meantime. We hope so. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Excellent. It's been a great Excellent pleasure. And thank you all for, for participating yeah. and for your questions. And uh, it gives rise to many, many more questions to explore. But thank you. Much appreciated you. your company. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Anthony. <clears throat> Bye. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Okay. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Bye. Saludos, saludos a Michelle, Anthony. Igualmente, Olga. Okay. Chao. Chao. Chao, chao. chao Rodrigo. Chao, Juan. Chao, Juan. Chao, Juan. Chao, Andrea. Juan. Chao. chao, chao, Rodrigo. Chao. Chao, Chet. Gracias por la Rodrigo. Hasta pronto. Hasta pronto. Bye, bye. Chet, thank you so much. Okay. Chao.